This morning, I'm delighted to welcome Dan uh, Jensen. Many of you know him. Dan has been a leader in this church for a long time. He goes back way before my time. But some of you, a few of you, have been here just as long. And, and uh, when my wife and I arrived here in the early 70s, he was already in some leader capacity. Also, he has taught many adult classes during that process. I know because I recruited him for many of them. Dan, welcome. Well, I've only been here 59 years. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, by popular demand, somebody asked if I would tell an oldie and spend joke. <laughs> you know, and I thought, well, maybe I should, if I could. And uh, anyway, that's how I'll start out today. It seems that Oli and Lena wanted to get in the chicken business. <laughs> and Oli came home, and he was so excited because Sven wanted to buy a baker's dozen of their chickens. Now, you know, we remember what a baker's dozen is, those of us that are older, 13, okay? So that's what he wanted to buy. So he wanted to buy 13 chickens from Oli and Lena. So so Oli and Lena said, "Well, how much should we charge them?" Well, Lena says, "You know, Cub Foods, you know, has them for about eight dollars. <laughs> we probably should be less than that. So let's do seven." We have to multiply them to find out, you know, the cost. Well, Oli said, that sounds good. I was good in math. <laughs> so let me multiply them. Seven times three is? 21. 21. <laughs> and seven times one is? Seven. seven. And then you have to add them together. <laughs> You get 28. And Lena looked at that and she says, you know, I think that's wrong. And he says, well, what do you mean? He said, well, it's got to be more than that. But she says, I remember my math teacher was very good. He told me that if we wanted to check our multiplication <laughs> by addition, we could take 13 and add to it you know, seven times. So they decided to do that. Well, 3 plus 3 is? 6. Plus 3? 9, 12, 12 15, 18, 21. 22, 23, 24, 25. <laughs> <laughs> but then Lena says, I know that you can check that also by dividing. <laughs> you can divide 7 into 28, and if it's correct, it should be 13 for an answer. Well, 7 doesn't fit into the 2, but the 7 does fit into the 8 one time. <laughs> one time 7 is 7, subtract is 21, 7 fits into 21 three times. <laughs>
Okay. We're going to learn for the next three weeks. We're going to talk about lessons that we can learn from the prophet Elijah. That's what we're going to spend our time with. Well, I'd like you to ask you the question today. What's the most popular purchase of books, uh, classification of books that are purchased like from a bookstore like Barnes & Noble? Think about what is the most popular book that is purchased. You know, self-help, maybe you think fiction, love mysteries, Louis the Moor. No, it's biographies and autobiographies are the most popular books that are purchased at a bookstore. People are interested in people's lives what they accomplished, how they did it, and so forth. Well, the Bible is full of stories of people and things that took place. When you think about the Bible, you think about the story of maybe Noah, Moses, go on, David, Daniel, all of those as you go along. Well, I'd like you to think about what is the most what is one of your favorite Old Testament characters? Just think about it for a minute. Who is it? And then think about, why do I like that individual or that story? Well, one of my favorite of Old Testament characters happens to be Elijah. And we're going to spend the next three weeks looking at the life of Elijah and the lessons that I, we can learn from him. I might encourage you the next couple of weeks to bring your Bibles with you. I know that you don't have a lot of light back here, and neither do I have a lot of light up here, it seems. But anyway, uh, you might like to carry your Bibles with you as you look at the lesson in your groups. You might remember some of the miracles that God did through Elijah. If you remember, he was taken up into heaven with the chariots of fire like, like Enoch. And later in his ministry, he had a sidekick named Elisha, very similar to Elijah. And Elisha has, you know, quite a story also. Now we also find Elijah mentioned in the New Testament several times. And I did not realize this, that he's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. The only one that's mentioned more are Jesus and Moses. But 30 times. Now, when you go to the Bible, you don't find a book entitled Elijah. He was an oral prophet. In other words, we just have his story as we go along. But he was mentioned, for instance, in Matthew 17, 1 through 3, the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the sun. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And you maybe remember that story in the Bible. They were up in the mountain, and all of a sudden there was Moses and Elijah, and they were talking with Jesus. Now Moses represented the law. You remember, dealing, going back with the law, Elijah is really representing the prophets that told of the coming of the Messiah. It's also mentioned in James 5.17. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Now, Elijah was a man just like us. This was very meaningful to my wife and I when we were leading mission trips to Ethiopia from Eagle Brook Church. <coughs> it encouraged us that we could do it. Because it says Elijah was just like us. You know, the people in the Bible were just ordinary people that God used. You're ordinary also. So much. And God can use you and I also. But 
that was very helpful to my wife and I as we went along in our leading these mission trips. Now, Elijah had been sent by God to be the messenger of bad news. God had sent Elijah to the northern kingdom of Israel. In other words, there were two kingdoms, if you remember. There was the northern and the southern. Now, remember, in King Ahab was the king. And then he had a dear wife named Jezebel. <laughs> they were not leaders that were following the ways of the Lord. In fact, they were doing just the opposite. They were leading the people of Israel to worship Baal, a false god. In other words, they were pagans. So Elijah came to announce an impending doom. Because of their disobedience, a drought was coming. There was going to be no rain or dew until he said so. Let's just look at a map here for just a minute. In the map, if you see, you've got horizontal lines and you've got vertical lines. Those are the two kingdoms. Okay, we had Solomon was the king, and then there got to be Rehoboam, Jeroboam, etc., and there got to be seven kings. And they couldn't agree and so forth, so they divided up into two areas. The northern kingdom, that is Israel. Okay, that's where the, um, Elijah was going to minister to. And then the southern kingdom, remember, was Judah. Okay, there were some tribes in the north, some tribes in the south. Now, if we look at the story of Elijah, we need to kind of get a little bit of an idea of what was going on with King Ahab. In chapter 16 of 1 Kings, it says, Ahab, some of our eyes, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than all those before him. Now, there were six kings before him, but Ahab did more evil than all of the others together. So it wasn't a good time to be a Christian in the northern kingdom. We go on and read in this book, it says, Ahab also made an Asher pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. <laughs> Ahab's probably his greatest downfall was he married Jezebel the pagan woman. She was from Sidon. She brought her wicked religion with her. And when she came to be Ahab's wife, she supported 850 <laughs> prophets of her moral cult and tried to kill all the prophets of God. Ahab just joined her, followed along. And that was the way it was when Elijah came upon the scene. To me, Ahab was kind of henpecked. He just did what Jezebel wanted him to do. In 1 Kings chapter 17 is where we pick up the story of Elijah. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, when you think about that, King Ahab, he was king. Here comes this guy up to him. We don't know anything about him. He just appears and he tells Ahab there's going to be no rain. What kind of a nut are you? Yeah. Probably what Ahab thought. I don't know. You know? But then as we think of Elijah, if we go to 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, it says, They replied, He was a man with a garment of hair and with a leather belt around his waist. The king said, Oh, that was Elijah the Tishbite. Now, does that remind you of anybody? Yeah, John the Baptist. Very similar. You know, John the Baptist was so like Elijah that when people saw John the Baptist, they often thought he was Elijah. I think that's kind of interesting. When you go through the New Testament, you read about John the Baptist, oh, 
people are going to see Elijah. You know, there's a story about a, a father and son, and uh, the father told the son, and he said, you know, I'm going to give you a, a new car if you can get straight A's at college. And the son thought, oh, all right. So he worked hard. He worked hard. He came home, and he had a 4.2 average. So he thought, well, I'm going to get a car. But during that time, he let his hair grow. He let his beard grow. And he looked kind of scruffy. You know? And the father said, I know what I said. But he said, I can't give you a new car when you look the way you look. You know, and the, and the son said, well, Dad, that's how Jesus looked. He was, had long hair, had a beard. Elijah had long hair, had a beard. John the Baptist had long hair and had a beard. Well, they had an argument. The next morning, the son woke up, looked out his window, and there was a donkey. <laughs>
somehow God had the ravens come with bread and meat for him for a matter of time. God took care of it. Elijah had to totally depend upon God to supply the food. And that's what he did. You know, and I think, uh, so he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the ravine, east of the Jordan, stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. You know, those, they were scavengers. I don't know about the meat, but it seemed that Elijah didn't hesitate one bit. Elijah was learning to depend upon God. He went. He depended upon God to do what he said he would do. He would supply him with meat and bread. <clears throat> now God protected Elijah. He fed him for a while. I think it did a lot for Elijah's faith at that time and his willingness to trust God. Did it take a lot for Elijah to trust him? Oh, I think so. I wonder if that raven is going to come, is what you might think. You know? How long? <coughs> I don't know how long God fed him that way. But then there got to be a problem. Sometime later, the book dried up. How come? Well, it didn't rain. Just like some of our lakes are getting down. Minnehaha Falls, not a thing right now. Nothing there. There is no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. Oh my. Go to Zarephath of Sidon. Well, that's interesting. But again, <coughs> Elijah doesn't hesitate. He went. There was no more water in the creek. It had dried up, so he had to go to plan B. I don't think he panicked. He went to Sidon. Now if you remember Tishbe, Sidon is way up in here, Zarephath. Oh, uh oh, that's a little bit of a problem. He's no longer in the land, the promised land. He's in a pagan land. Who came from that area? Jezebel. That's where she came from. Jezebel, Sidon, Baal worship. And a widow is going to provide for you. Oh yeah. Being a widow in those days, ladies, was not, was like a death sentence. Remember, it was a problem for Naomi. For those of you that remember that story in the book of Ruth. In the New Testament, remember the church commanded to care for the widows. Widows were not providers in those days. But yet, Elijah is supposed to go to a city to find this woman that's going to care for him. Only God could do that. So he went. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, <coughs> oh, there was a widow. She was gathering some sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? So as she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and bring me please a piece of bread. Oh, a widow going to get his water. And then he wants, he throws in a little bit of a kicker. He wants some bread. Her reply, as surely as the Lord your God lives. No, she knew he was a foreigner. She knew he was not from there. She said, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour or meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and take a meal for myself and my son, and then I'm going to eat it, and then I'm going to die, because I don't have anything left. Someone in one of the commentaries had said that she got a little feisty. I don't know if she got feisty or not, but she maybe did. He was expecting a lot out of her. 
Now, we need to look at Elijah's response. Elijah says, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives back rain. So, Elijah tells her that the flour won't run out, the oil won't run out, but first, make me a loaf of bread, or a piece of bread. You know, what would you have done, ladies, if Elijah spoke to you, and you knew that you had just enough bread for you and your son? That's all you had. She had to make a choice. Her faith is really challenged. She did not grow up with the God of Israel. She was most likely a Baal worshiper. She had a decision to make. Should she take the lids off the jars and the jug make bread for herself and son? Or should she give it to this God who says it won't run out? Well, maybe there was some hope there for her. And she thought, well, maybe he's right. You know, there are times in our life when we have to decide if we're going to take the lid off or not. Sometimes if we want to see God's actions and receive his blessing, we have to take the lid off and offer it to God. I think sometimes God likes the lid that's why he uses ordinary people also. He wants us to depend upon him, just like Elijah depended upon him. So the widow, she pours a little bit of oil, the flour, out of the jar, fashions a little cake. She's been uh, using just a little every day, and now some stranger, some foreigner wants him Wants, yeah, wants him to make, she want, he wants her to make him some bread. She looks at her child. He's probably has a bloated stomach, more than likely. He probably has jaundice in his eyes. He probably has sticks for legs and arms, just like her. I'm sure she was uh, thin, didn't have much. Then she thought, maybe what Elijah says is true. Can I hope that maybe God will come through and save us? We're going to die anywhere, anyway. The boy is hungry, so she makes the bread. He smells it. He would like it for himself. But he, she takes the bread, she goes outside, and she gives it to the stranger. Now, can you imagine what she was thinking as she gave it to the stranger? And as she walked back into the house, I wonder if there's any thought left for me and my son. Is there enough oil in the jug to make the bread? She went back in, and there was. There was flour there. There was oil there. I'm sure that tears filled her eyes. Elijah stayed with her. He probably lived on the top of the roof in a small room and leaned to it. He didn't have to worry about rain. It wasn't going to rain. So that's where he was. I think it's an amazing lesson on faith. The woman trusted Elijah's God and found she had all she needed. You know, at times we have to step out in faith to receive all that God wants to provide for us. Maybe, you know, we need to be like the widow and believe in the promises of God. For your life, we need to take a step of faith. You know, I think God provides in unexpected ways. Who would have ravens feed you? Flour and oil never run out? Interesting. 
there were things, well, things were going along pretty good. Now, there wasn't a lot of variety in their diet, was there? Think about it. Bread, bread, and bread. Just like the Israelites. Manna, manna, manna. Mm. We don't, we like variety, you know, in our food. Well, as you deal with it, in verses 17, 80, 17 and 18, things were pretty good. But sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse. He finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what, Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Do you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? She was blaming Elijah. She connects really the sin with the cause of her son's death. Now, Elijah shows compassion. He says to her, give me your son. Elijah replied, he took him in her, from her arms, carried him to the upper room. In other words, I think he went out the outside stairway, went up into where he was. Upper room. Laid him on his bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? He was concerned. He seemed to be having a hard time with what had happened. He cries out to God. He stretches over the boy three times and prays that his life would be returned. The boy's life is restored. And Elijah brings the boy down to his mother. And her response was, oh, I forgot to read this, but that's what he did. I said that, I guess. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. <coughs> Elijah's God became her God. The fact that the flour and the oil didn't change her mind. It was the raising of her son that caused her to believe in God. She became a follower of the living God. I'd like you to think about what did Elijah go through to depend upon God? Do you think his dependence upon God increased as he went along? You know, out of the blue, he had to face King Ahab. Now, I don't know if how exactly God spoke to him and told him to go and speak to uh, King Ahab that it wasn't going to rain, but he did. He had to depend upon what God told him was true. Then he had to depend, go to this brook, and he had to, you know, depend upon ravens every morning. I don't know how long he was there. I, you know, thinking about it, I thought, well, oh, maybe six months. I don't know. But it was a while before the brook ran dry. He depended upon the ravens and the water. And then he had to go to Zarephath, to a pagan area, and find a widow that was going to take care of him. And remember, widows were not ones that were providers at that time. And then the oil and the flour of the jug and the jar didn't run out. And then the sun died, but came back to life. You know, as we look at this story, I think Elijah truly was a man of God. He learned to depend upon God. Well, how about you and I? Have you and I learned to depend upon God? How do you increase your dependence upon God? You'll talk about that today in your group. You know, Elijah's name means Jehovah is my God. We too, you and I, can be used by him. <coughs> Probably not to live in a brook. But there's different ways that God can use you and I. Do we depend upon God? You know, and again it says, you know, remember... Elijah was a person just like us, just like you and I. God used.
lives as ordinary people. Well, we'll pick up our story here next week. And I'd encourage you, if you take the time to look at 1 Kings 18, read it over, because that's what we'll be doing next week. This, you talk about your dependence upon God, and Table leaders, you maybe have too many questions today, so pick and choose what you have or what you can do or through. Let's close in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for the story of Elijah. The lessons that we can learn from it. Lord, thank you. Help us, God, to depend upon you in our life with things that we go through. Help us, God, to speak for you, to live for you, to be obedient to you. May we go today as we leave here rejoicing in